Brain one and brain two, or thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. I spent a lot of time thinking about boards of directors. And obviously, what you're doing is incredibly relevant to that. And boards of directors often make really dumb decisions. But somebody's got to make these decisions. And how far have you been able to extend your work from these sort of laboratory settings into looking at what actually happens in boards, committees, councils, where people are, are making quite sort of gnarly decisions? I'm afraid we have really not gone outside the lab. In many of our experiments, the group we talk about is two people, and we have very little on more than two people. And this is because, in a sense, it becomes prohibitively expensive. Um, because you typically need, let us say, if we say you need 16 individuals to do a, a normal experiment, you would need 32 to do an experiment with groups of two people, and it explodes the larger the sizes of the groups you get. So that's one problem. The, can, can I continue? Yes. I <laughs> wanted to say that, um, in fact, Chris and Dan Bang together have just written a review of all studies that exist about group decision-making, and they have over 200 papers, and they published the review in uh, Royal Society Open Science. Um, in fact, it was me who nagged them and nagged them to do this because the reason why we needed that paper was to come to some actual recommendations at the end. And there are a number of recommendations that come out of all this survey of these mainly laboratory experiments. Um, and they give, of course, um, ideas of what might be done um, in, in experiments that are more um, realistic than the ones that have been done so far. But we are to some extent, beginning to try and make these apply to academic groups, such as people dishing out grants, people considering who should be fellows of the Royal Society, or whatever it may be, <laughs> and whether you can get rid of some of these biases and make better decisions. So we're trying to do that, but it's very difficult to do actual research on it. Yeah. Okay, there's a gentleman in the second row on the other side at the end. Thank you. So when we interact with each other, our emotions about how we feel about the other person are, are very important. And it's been suggested that the internet is a kind of boiler room which makes us much more angry at the outgroup members. So do you see the internet as something that is bringing us together and helping us align or is driving us apart? You have I think both. <laughs> um, I think in, in many ways it's not different from what there's always been, except this is so much bigger. We have in-groups that we can search for that are just so much bigger than they would ever have been when we had, more, had to have face-to-face -face contact or even phone-to-phone -phone contact. So I think there is, is that sort of escalation going on. But in principle, I think it's the same things. The emotions are incredibly uh, prominent and, and indeed dominant in this communication. And, uh, and definitely um, of, of great interest. I mean, one of the studies that I, I was very interested in uh, about uh, how uh, social media get um, propagated uh, showed that if a message contained emotion words, it would be propagated much, much more than if it was a, a neutral message. So, yes, the emotions are are clearly a really vital and, and incredibly important ingredient. You, your question might have been, why is it that we are so angry and show this? Or is that emotion helping us to align better in, in, in your view? It, it does. It does that, I think. If you show your outrage, you know that your in-group will, will applaud you and say, here's somebody who said the right thing. Perhaps, of course, you will offend the out-group. Um, but that's but... the whole point. <laughs> <laughs> but I should also say that um, I think the internet has a problem of removing diversity because we tend only to interact with the people who are like us, and that's much easier to do on the internet yeah. than in real life, as it were. Yeah. Colin, 
coordonamiento. Most social structures that we have are authoritarian. I mean, everything from armies to, you know, industrial organizations to parliaments to even universities, families. So if there were such an advantage in collaborative decision making, it should have evolved. There should have been a selective process which enabled it to emerge. Why, has, why do we need recommendations to do it? Why hasn't it just happened? Well, it seems to have emerged in other animals. Particularly, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, bees in particular, I'm fascinated by about how they can make incredibly um, well-controlled group decisions. So I guess there's something wrong with humans. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question, M Martin, right at the very top, the lady in there. Thank you for your presentation. I was thinking about a lot of this in terms of for foreign policy analysis and human decision makers in that sense. How would you, do, how would you apply your studies to like the bureaucratic institutions and then the individuals within them? What was the question? Um, how, how could we carry out experiments in, yes. in institutions? In um, I think it certainly could be done. It would, it's, not, it's not an easy enterprise. Um, I certainly am very, very interested in, in the sort of uh, decisions that have to do with um, selections. You know, when somebody gets a job or gets a grant um, or gets a prize, you know, what actually happens, what goes into this? And it, it is a very complex process. Um, and, I'm, and I must say, uh, just to uh, respond to Colin's question here, the group chair, the group leader, does have a very important role in, in coordinating and steering what the collective says. So that's actually something that is, is almost like a different type of research that's needed for that. And, and we really should get more knowledge about what it means to be a good chair, what that chair should be doing. And some idea... Uh, that came out of this review, I think, was that perhaps the leader has to be the kind of metacognitive awareness of the group. There has to be monitoring what's going on and uh, reflect for the group members rather than just taking this raw emotion that otherwise comes across. I mean, there's a problem in this country that I believe it's not, you're not allowed to do research on decision-making in juries whereas you can in the States. So that would be an interesting problem. There's, there's two people sitting next to each other. I just want to give this middle section a chance to take a couple of questions. Um, I just wonder about, in your research, uh, in, in sort of combined decision-making, where you have multiple people making a decision, uh, have you looked at all at the, the speed of decision-making? And do you find that... Uh, uh, is there anything to be said about um, having multiple people making a decision? Are the faster ones better, or, are the, the, or, or is it the slower ones? I think it depends on what the problem is. So, the, roughly speaking, this is the distinction between what we like to call a gut decision and a deliberative decision. If you have a great deal of experience in a stable environment, then the fast decisions are obviously quite good. But if it's a novel situation and, and you're in a volatile environment, then probably more deliberation is needed. But you may not have the luxury. The problem, of course, of is that sometimes you have to make your decision quickly. There's always a trade off between speed and accuracy. On this side. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I'm just thinking of uh, techniques and lateral thinking, and for example, in brainstorming where well, you're attempting to generate the maximum number of solutions. Now, in that, uh, it seems to me that what one does create is a very formal structure to work within to enable people to maintain the sort of discussion. I wonder, could you comment on that sort of approach and how that can be used to, to expand the ability to, to make decisions? Um, and the other thing that, that struck me, again, about leadership, and this comes from antiquity, where you've got the, the, the philosophers and the Greek schools and the Roman schools, uh, uh, where in fact there was a leader, the teacher, the students had had discussion. That contrasted it with Judaism, where, where there was a didactic system where pairs of equals discussed. Now, it seems to me there's a lot of issues around leadership in this, and I just wonder, could you comment on those? 
The brainstorming is very interesting, and I believe it has more recently become under criticism, because as far as I remember, the brainstorming, lots of people put out ideas, and you're not supposed to criticize them. There are just lots of them on the table. And as head number one was saying, argument is actually a good thing, and you make better decisions if you object to other people's ideas and say why they are wrong. So this is a, perhaps a better way of, discuss, of running these group decisions. Yeah, just to make a comment about brainstorming. Yeah. You're absolutely right about the first session. Yeah. The second session is a review session yeah. where you ah. criticize ideas. Yeah. So that's ah, good, yeah. Just as important. Yeah. Good. So we would think, yes, the criticism is actually very important. I mean, the, the, the problem which we hinted at, of course, is whenever you make a group decision, you should take into account the competence of the different people in different areas. So to some extent, you have to listen to one person because they know what is relevant to the decision, whereas other people may not. And that's, I think, the most difficult thing, is to find out who is actually competent at what. And that, that I think, is something that needs much more work of how we identify such people. And this is where I bring in my liking for diversity, because... With diverse people, with many diverse people, you will have different skills represented. So you can be prepared, you know, that some can, different people can speak to certain problems. Other people should be silent. Of course, that is the big problem. They might not be. <laughs> okay, going back to the man in the middle. Okay. So um, I know you've already commented on the first question. You only work with small groups, maybe two people. But can you comment on um, group size optimization? If I've got a problem at work and I've got to form a group to do it, um, do I get just myself and somebody else, two people, or do I get 50 people, 20 people in that group? Is group optimization, the size, how, how does that work? I think, as usual, I mean, what the Condorcet jury theorem, going right back to that, shows is the more people you better, the better you do, but it rapidly asymptotes. So there's a point where, it, although you would do better with more people, it's actually not worth the trouble because it would take much longer to reach a decision. There's some interesting work that Bahador has recently been doing suggesting that you can do better with several small groups than you can with one large group, which is an interesting thing to explore. So, so large groups, very large groups, are not actually... necessarily a good thing and <laughs> <laughs> especially in parliament um, <laughs> the answer by the way your prediction is that the final brexit bill will be 106 billion so remember <laughs> so remember we're, we're, we're going to keep this piece of paper and we're going to put it in our archives i think so I'm not quite sure if, um, if all of you know that uh, discourses have been running um, at the Royal Institution since 1825. And so I'm sure you can imagine that during that time, we've had so many distinguished speakers um, present their research uh, to the public and members of the Royal Institution, um, including um, Pierre Curie, who gave a, a talk here. And we think, we're not sure that Marie Curie was in the audience. Um, but we, th we also think, actually, that tonight is a historic first um, in that we don't think there's been two heads in terms of a husband and a wife present uh, the discourses. So uh, I hope you'll agree that tonight has been historic, but also fascinating, and it's given us a lot of things to think about. So if you would like to join me now in, in saying thank you so much to Chris and Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank Bahadur. <laughs> <laughs>